Jeff Ronnie here with the boa file. This is a female had babies on uh, April the 21st, early in the morning. This is when she was gravid, when I ran around a few weeks ago and took video of a whole bunch of gravid females. This is a jungle ghost. She was bred by a prodigy motley, and she is screaming beautiful, even though she's sticking out all over the place. I was talking and she got a little excited, hyperventilated ventilated a little. Took this picture about a week ago. She looked like death warmed over. She's so drawn out. And then uh, Friday morning, I found her making a nest. A couple of pictures here. And then I took a picture of her through the glass. She was in lock and load mode. She was all kinked up, all tense. And that tail was in that position I've seen many, many times over the years getting ready to have these puppies. I was pretty excited in the middle of my workout. I came back and checked on her after doing a couple of sets, and there she is. She popped out the first one. That was my cue to get the camera going. By the time I got the camera going, things were in full motion. Uh, she had four or five of them out, and I got my camera set up. Took me a little while to get that done. And I'm going to give you, here in this video, I'm doing a little voiceover. Oh, here comes one now. Little puppy coming out, coming out to meet the world. I'm going to give you a color commentary as these babies are being born. And then uh, in some of the moments when there isn't so much happening, I'm going to just talk about breeding boas. How's that sound? So if you've started now, you have to watch the whole thing because you might miss some really valuable little nugget that I might throw out there um, as things pop into my head as I'm going through this really fun to watch this they ring and ring and ring those babies out and most of the time females squirt out babies just one at a time which is how she did it even though she was just uh, enormous and a little bit you're going to see me pan over you could see the front of the lump she's pushing that whole lump down all at the same time look at those little guys popping their head up for their first breath of air. The male that bred her is a prodigy motley, so these babies are all double hat prodigy and anorthristic. First time I've made these, which seems crazy. <laughs> it's taken me this long. And uh, so we've got a lot of motleys, hypo motleys, and jungle in the mix, and uh, just regular hypos and regular jungles trying to get the camera situated here sorry about that uh, didn't have a good way to hold the camera and a lot of times they wave their hair they wave their hair they wave their tail around a lot and sometimes dig that tail kind of through the babies I think kind of to get the babies moving get them to pop out of the membrane you know uh, maybe me overthinking it but uh, it kind of seems like that's what they're doing and uh, it's just really I never get tired of watching this. I could watch this every single day. And in May, I may. I might have to watch this almost every day in May. <laughs> May is really going to be hectic. Uh, starting in uh, about 10 days from now. But uh, they start pushing that lump back. And it looks like they're pushing the whole lump. And and I always wonder, I wa I'm watching them, and I'm always wondering, why don't they just keep squeezing up at the top? And squeeze the whole thing out like a tube of toothpaste so that they're popping out, you know, two, three, four, five, six at a time. Just a continuous, but they never seem to do it that way. doesn't matter how often I think that they should. They just, they have their own way of doing it. So what she's doing is she's very tense and she squeezes one right down to the cloaca. And then she just squeezes one out. There's one coming now. Squeezes them out one at a time. First comes a little ooze. A little, uh, a little goo, as I called it. Many years ago. And then the baby comes. Uh, there's a lot of goo inside the membrane. Which, uh, that's really not a very scientific term, I guess. <laughs> but that's what I call it. And it really lubes the, um, the path for those babies to come out. 
She's waving that tail around, getting her ready to squirt out another one. There's a lot of them. It's a really good litter. And uh, there is, of course, there is the proverbial slug to keep me humble. And so the, so the haters have something to, to scoff at because, of course, they never have slugs. <laughs> Anyways, so these little guys are coming out. Uh, they're not trying to go toward the camera. They're just trying to push their way out of the membrane. These babies are all alive. They, uh, I sent a picture out one time many, many years ago, 20 years ago when the internet was a new thing. It was shortly after Al Gore invented it, of course. And I posted a picture of a bunch of baby Argentine boas. They were in the goo. Some of them were in the membrane. Some of them were not. And this guy got all bent out of shape. He was going to report me to, I don't know who he's going to report me to, but, but going to report me to somebody for posting pictures of dead snakes. Of course, it was a still image, so he couldn't see they were very much alive. Here comes another one. See that? Sometimes you get right on it and you can see the baby actually coming out of the cloaca. But you know, typically when they're giving birth like this, they'll have the tail kind of pushed in the goo, in the mess where the babies are. You can just see the whole mass of babies kind of being mushed or pushed along by the babies after they're being delivered by the mom. So she typically won't lift the tail high enough that you get a good shot at it. She's doing it now so we can see it. But a lot of times it's just pushing in the goo. Reminds me, uh, I did not see my first babies being born until, look at that. I just, I just am fascinated by it. I always have been. I've seen it a lot many, many times over the years. This is the first actual birth I saw this year. Definitely not my first litter this year. But uh, the first time I ever saw being or baby boas being born was about my eighth litter. And that was like in my seventh year. So I had one litter the first year, one litter the second year, one litter the third year, I think the fifth year I had two, and then one litter, one litter, and then and then it started to take off because I had more and more boas and uh, started having more and more babies. So it got to be a little more common than, than just one litter a year. But uh, when I saw that first litter being born, I called my friend, uh, his name is Vince Jimerson, and uh, I was just so excited that that I got to see babies being born and he laughed at me because he'd had babies, I believe twice then, and he saw all of the babies being born both times. So he had one up on me, but, uh, so anyways, these babies are still coming. Lots and lots of babies. First, uh, first litter I had was, uh, was in a gigantic cage. It was, a uh, in a section of like four foot by four foot and two feet high. And uh, I had checked the female and I I was looking at her thinking that she probably wasn't pregnant. I, I didn't know, Ooh, here comes the baby. Here it comes. Now, you know what's weird is a lot of times when they come out, they seem to be belly up. I don't know why that is. Um, I haven't been able to figure that out and it's a, it's kind of frustrating because you're looking, trying to figure out what it is. And you usually can't tell what it is by looking at a belly shot, you know. <laughs> Bellies are pretty common or pretty even typically. They're not, uh, they don't have the pattern on them. I mean, you can't tell what a jungle's belly looks like or even a motley's belly for that matter. I guess a motley belly can be a little bit distinct. But uh, by looking at the bellies, you can't necessarily tell what they are. Here comes another one. Quite a few come out so far. Probably a dozen. They're uh, pretty calm babies. They're just sitting around. Most of them aren't really doing much. Once they're certain that they pop their head out of the membrane, you know, I'm sure that they have an instinctive 
um, desire to pop their head out of the membrane and, and get that first breath. Once they've done that, usually they kind of hang out. They just sit where their moms have them. And then it's just uh, waiting for the rest of the family to show up. Of course, they haven't met any of the rest of the family until they come out. <laughs> so to speak. But uh, sometimes you'll, you'll get a female that does pop out two or three or four at a time. That's typically going to be a really big female. It's not your, um, not your smaller female that typically you're going to see that kind of thing from. So back to the, uh, the little tale about my first litter. It was a Colombian boa, and uh, her name, of course, was Big Mama. Talked about this before. And uh, she was in a four foot by four foot section by herself. And she was leaning all, all the way up against a side wall and kind of in a tight S shape all along the back wall, just like this one was. All you couldn't see much of it. You just saw the tail in that pick. And she was all stretched out and all kinked up. And I didn't know when babies might come. Um, I was guessing that she was pregnant because she looked really big for a while. And then about that time, she wasn't looking very big anymore. So I wasn't really thinking I was going to be getting babies. And that uh, was like 8.30 in the evening. And I went back and checked it. It was 9 or 9.15, something like that. And I uh, went back in and she was all done. There was 16 slugs all in a row. 16 slugs. I don't remember which order they were in. It was either slugs and babies or it was all babies and then slugs. And, and then there were 16 babies. And I was just... I was ecstatic, you know, and I had no one to call. <laughs> I had no, no Herper buddies. Um, told a couple of friends of mine at work and they thought I was crazy. And I uh, called my dad. I think I, I think it was the next day I called my dad cause I was so excited cause I, you know, bred boa constrictors. I had babies and my dad said to me, now what are you going to do with all those boas? <laughs> Same thing people ask me now sometimes when I have babies. Now, what are you going to do with all those babies? Well, I'm going to keep the nicest ones, of course, and sell the rest. Buy rats. <laughs> so you see that huge mass up at the front there. She's got all those babies squished down there. And she's ringing as hard as she can. I was concerned that this animal was going to die. She was so skinny in the front. Very unusual for one to lose that much weight. I have a lot of females, especially smaller females. This isn't a big female. She's maybe six foot. That um, really, it doesn't seem to take that much out of them. Um, it takes a lot more out of big females usually in a typical scenario. But uh, this particular female, she was really, really skinny in the front. Skinny enough, I was concerned that she might actually starved to death but uh, she didn't she was fine and uh, turns out I was worried about about nothing but um, then I was worried she wouldn't have the strength to push all these babies out because I mean it just looked like she was skin and bones in the front just really really skinny but uh, as you could tell from that pic I posted that pic on Facebook and Instagram before too <clears throat> but she proved I was concerned about or overly concerned about nothing and uh, had all these babies without any issues whatsoever. No issues. So I set up, I set up all these babies when I got them or when I had them. This was in Clarksburg, West Virginia in 1986. I didn't, there were no such thing as racks. Nobody had racks. I certainly didn't know anybody that had racks, if there were. And you couldn't go to the pet shop and buy some kind of a small cage. Um, I didn't know how to house them. So I'd, I'd gotten some, um, oh, I don't even know what you call it, like, like a thick masonite plywood or a paneling and put myself together a box that was about three feet long 
two feet deep, front to back, and about a foot high. And that's what I put my babies in. I put all those babies in there and took out the babies and the slugs, cleaned them up. That was my first experience with baby goo. And, you know, come to think of it, even as a rookie, I knew instinctively you should not wear rubber gloves. <laughs> so I didn't wear rubber gloves even back then. You know what? I have never put on a rubber glove ever to pick up a baby boa in the goo. Not one time. How's that? <laughs> That's impressive. So I put these babies in this tub. I didn't know how you're supposed to take care of them. I mean, there were no, um, none of the books told you how to do that. They gave you kind of natural history on how they thought boas lived in the wild. The book said that the gestation period was four to eight months or some of them were 10 months. You know, they didn't know. People were just, they published the uh, best information that they could get, which was, you know, an estimation from somebody who had a zoo once or wherever they got it. You know, anecdotal information where people weren't really documenting anything. Oh, here I pan over so you can see the front of the lump. Front of, front end of that lump is there. I uh, I stood up a piece of black plastic uh, between the front of the cage and the back of the cage where she had her head kind of back in that back corner so that she wouldn't see the light from the camera. And usually that discourages them from coming over and seeing me. Then when I shot this video, I kept my mouth shut the whole time because if, if I start talking, they, they can feel the vibration from my speech. And when they feel that vibration, it disturbs them and they turn around and look. And I don't want her turn around and looking hard at me while I'm trying to shoot this video. So here she goes. She's popping out another one in the corner. You see these contractions, they're just, everything is in super slow motion. She gathers up the skin. See that? Isn't that amazing? It comes, it comes up kind of like an accordion. And then she pinches right there where she's got it gathered up to. And then she rings back toward the vent. And this is a continuous operation, uh, which takes place in multiple separate locations throughout the female She's doing this pinching and contracting. See that? Here comes a baby. Look at that. Miracle of birth. Sorry, that's a jungle. I'm distracted. So I set these baby boas up in the tub, and I actually cut a hole in the bottom of the tub, and I took a Tupperware container, and cut the, the bottom so the Tupperware container would fit in that hole. And that's where I put water. So when I wanted to change water, I had to take this Tupperware container out, you know, and there's hole was there. I had to cover the hole so the babies wouldn't get out. And, uh, and then I changed the water, uh, periodically. And I started to raise rats because I had 16 baby mouths to feed. So I had to raise rats, right? <laughs> I had already been raising some rats because I had, I don't know how many I had. I had four or five boas at that time. They were all, um, the rest of them were in a four by four foot cage. And uh, the, the cage was actually, it's a single cage that was divided in half. So that was, that was the first divided cage that I, that I had invented. <laughs> it was uh, made by a four foot by eight foot cheetah plywood. And I had a divider directly in the center that I screwed in and I kept all the boas on one side, a four by four foot side. And then the uh, breeder pair were on the opposite side where the female ultimately had her baby. She was already pregnant. I was convinced. So I had moved him over to the other side. There's a scary story about how I heated this cage, which will give uh, electricians and people with common sense, the willies. Uh, but it didn't seem to have given me the willies at the time. But I raised the bottom of that cage about four inches. So it's about four inches from the floor 
to the bottom of the cage. The sides of the cage went all the way to the floor, and then the bottom was raised up. And under that cage, I took another piece of plywood, I covered it with tin foil, and I laid a light bulb. I had wired up and with a little socket, a light bulb on this piece of plywood that was covered with tin foil so that it wouldn't slip. Because if it slipped, you know, it could go on the carpet. And I, I didn't want to start a fire, right? So I'm, I'm doing this uh, safely. <laughs> so I put this on the plywood, on the tin foil, and on the bottom of the cage. Oh, here comes another one. Just going to pinch another one out. Oh, we're going to pan up and look up here. Let's see what we see. Look at that lump. You can tell there's still a lot of babies in there. I'm wondering, holy mackerel, how much of how much goo am I going to have here? So on the bottom of the cage, corresponding to the same place where I was going to put that light bulb, I put uh, tin foil on the bottom of the cage. I stapled it on so it wouldn't fall off. So of course, that's hundred hundred percent safe, right? A light bulb. Like it was probably a hundred watt bulb, I don't remember. A light bulb between the floor and the bottom of the cage, separated by a piece of tin foil. It was crazy, just crazy. When uh, ultimately, about a year after that, when we moved, a year and a half, um, the bottom of that cage was black, <laughs> like charcoal under the tin foil was black like charcoal and we're just fortunate it didn't combust you know that didn't start on fire but uh the crazy stuff you do when you're a dumb kid and um just don't know any better it was pretty dumb but uh so that was my uh, my first experience with setting up a cage so a female could thermal regulate um i didn't read in any book how to set up a cage you know, I didn't talk to anybody about how to breed them, so I didn't really know the right way to do it. Uh-oh. She's no longer behind that black divider, that black piece of plastic I put up. She's coming out. She's just wondering what's going on. You can see how skinny the front end of, his, of, of her is up there, right up to that kink. So she's still got, I don't know, a third of the load still in there that she needs to push out. pretty cool. So I'm watching all this and uh, not talking. I wanted to tell my wife that I was having babies, but I was using my phone to shoot the video, so I couldn't let her know. I just had to sit there and watch this by myself, and I couldn't even text it to anybody because, you know, I'm excited. You know, I want to brag and uh, let people know I'm, you know, some friends of mine know that I'm having these babies, but can't do it. Phone's tied up shooting a video look at that see that kink right there she's pinching pinching those puppies down as they go down i haven't done this before this is a what they call this a voiceover i guess so i'm playing the video watching it on a little tablet and babbling endlessly as it's uh going by here so that's how i set up my first babies and i and i started to raise rats so, how do you feed baby boas? Well, <laughs> you're going to love this. So, I brought home, like, fuzzy rats, which are big. Uh, the babies, turns out, were ginormous babies. Um, I didn't know it at the time. I just thought they were babies, you know. But uh, I brought them home, fuzzy rats. So, how do you feed 16 baby boas fuzzy rats? Well, I brought home about 30 fuzzy rats. I took another Tupperware bowl, I put the fuzzy rats in the Tupperware bowl, and I put that bowl in the cage that I had those babies in. That's it. <laughs> Again, uh, you know better, right? I did not. I was fi figuring this out as I went along, uh, all of it. 
I mean, couldn't find out from anybody how to do any of it. So I had to kind of do hit or miss, hunt and peck. Let's figure out my own way to do it. And I did that method for months. And I would just put the bowl in there and then I'd sit and watch them. And the boas would crawl over. Some of them were more bold than others. They would crawl over and I'd see them sneaking up and the fuzzies would be climbing up the edge with their eyes shut and they'd be peering over the edge. Well, the boa would come up close and wham! They would grab that fuzzy, drag it out of the bowl, wrap it. And uh, they would kill it and eat it. And so I would see in this big container, there'd be six or eight of them that were killing the fuzzies and eating them. And the other ones, you know, hadn't started eating yet. You know, some ate the first time I offered, some didn't. And some of them would eat more than one. And, well, of course, they're snakes. They can eat huge meals, right? So, again... I didn't know. <laughs> and uh, when I got tired of watching, I would just leave them. I would just leave the bowl of fuzzies in there, and they would eat them. So af after about four months of doing that, um, one of the times that I came in after I would set up the bowl of fuzzies, I found uh, one baby had swallowed another baby about halfway down, and uh, they were both dead. So that's the one and only time I had that happen. Um, I realized that that was not the ideal way to do it. And I just, it just, just didn't cross my mind that it was possible before that happened. So you, you live and learn, right? So after that, I'd, I would feed them individually. Uh, I would hold the fuzzy with my fingers because I didn't know anything about hemostats. They probably, I'm sure there were hemostats around, but that was a medical device, and they didn't trust me with medical devices. <laughs> that was another one. They didn't trust me with medical devices. So uh, I would hand them to them. I would have it between, you know, my two forefingers, dangle it over them, and they would grab it and kill it. And um, so I'd feed them one at a time in the same container. I'd just kind of separate them, you know, three or four inches apart. And I just never had trouble with them turning around and, and going after the other guy's rat. They would pretty much just eat as much as they wanted. And I would bring them home uh, rats, plenty of rats. You know, eventually I was bringing home 60 fuzzy rats. Then the rats, I started getting larger and larger. And some of them would eat three or four of them, which was really a ginormous meal uh, for them at that time. And uh, I didn't realize it. I didn't realize that that was... Um, probably not a good idea. So th those were the most power fed boas that I ever produced was that first litter. And they were born in February and we moved to Minnesota. Oh, I guess it was, it was that fall. It wasn't a year and a half later. It was only six, eight months later. So it was February. And then it was August when we were moving. Here she is. She's coming a little bit farther over. Wondering what in the world is going on over there. What's that bright light? And uh, I'm sure she could feel the heat. Here comes more goo. Another puppy. They typically, when they're having their babies, they just kind of go in the zone. And uh, they're not really uh, aware of me. If I talk too much, then they'll feel the vibration. And they'll start looking around, wondering what's going on. But mostly they're not paying too much attention. They're in a, in the zone, uh, kind of like they're in a trance, having their babies. So I, I fed them and fed them and fed them. And in August of that year, we were moving to Minnesota from West Virginia. And here I am, I've got like 22 boas with me. I've got everything that me and my wife own in a full-size van, which included a couple of makeshift, much smaller cages that I'd made, uh, put everything into much smaller cages so we could move, and uh, had uh, 14 babies left, and the four or five adult boas, including Big Mama and Big Daddy, of course, uh, me, and my wife, and my son, who was uh, about to enter kindergarten in, um, in Minnesota. 
and we stopped at my uh, my grandmother's house in Chicago uh, for a visit. We were there for probably a week, and I decided I would I would call around to some pet shops see if I could sell some of those babies because um, I could use the money, and um, I really didn't need fourteen more baby boas. I mean, at the time. Uh, I was having a lot of trouble feeding that many um, because I didn't have that many rats and certainly didn't have the money to be buying buying lots of rats. So I took uh, 10 of them to a pet shop called Noah's Ark, which was in Elk Grove Village at the time, and they bought 10 of them for 35 bucks a piece. So it was 350 bucks, and I just thought that was unbelievable that I could get so much money for those babies that, you know, I had produced, they were born on my watch and, and, uh, it was like found money to me. But before I took those babies to Noah's Ark, I was really curious what size they were. So I'm surprised I'm remembering all this stuff. Anyways, I'm doing this with no notes, just what's in my head. So I, I decided, um, I'm kind of a numbers guy. I'm, my brain is uh, very mathematical. I think about things a lot of times in terms of numbers. Here comes the mom. She's coming around. Coming around to see what's going on. A lot of times they come around, they check out the babies. And uh, I'm the first one. I'm the first one to uh, document making the observation uh, that Boaz will tend to put ba push babies around with their head in the goo. In fact, I had a picture of it in my Reptiles Magazine article that was published in November of, uh, was it 96? And uh, that boa's name was Lois, incidentally, which uh, the fella I got her from, his name is Rob Ayot. He had named her Lois. She was a wonderful snake. But uh, she was pushing those babies around with her head, and I took a picture of it. I thought it was so neat, uh, not knowing that, you know, people didn't know that that happened. But that uh, was one of the first things that I'd kind of figured out or found out about a behavior that Boas did. So before I took them to the pet shop, I decided I was going to measure them all. And I figured out that if you put a boa along a wall, usually they will, they will kind of move themselves up close to the wall and straighten themselves out completely straight. So you can get a good measurement on them. Um... And so that's what I did. I measured all 14 of them. I put them up against the wall. I uh, put them right next to the wall where they were touching the wall. And then to feel more secure, they would kind of nestle themselves over to the wall. And I'd wait till they straightened out and I'd measure them. Well, they were big. <laughs> really big. So the biggest one, who wants to guess what the biggest one's name was? Who wants to guess? Big baby, of course. <laughs> big mama, big daddy, and big baby. Big baby was 60 inches. Eight months old, five foot long. That's right. <laughs> That's a fact. Eight foot, or uh, eight months old. And she was 60 inches. Eventually, I did breed her a couple of times. She had, she had the biggest baby boas I ever had came from that animal. And she had some slugs in the first litter, and they were literally the size of tennis balls. I mean, I've never seen slugs that big. Look, so she did do a little pushing around. This is the mom. She did do a little pushing around, but she just pushed around in the aspen. She didn't actually push around the babies. She went up once or twice and kind of got her nose in there just a little bit but she was mainly just pushing the aspen around and I waited for about an hour because I really wanted to get some good video of her doing that particular behavior that's right there that's about as close as you ever get to her doing what I wanted to get a really good video of her doing but she didn't do it a little bit there but um didn't really didn't really do it like I was hoping so I measured all of them, and they averaged these baby boas that were eight months old. They averaged 48 inches. 
the smallest one was 43, which is terrible. Um, all of those bows, of course, that was 37 years ago, 38 years ago, those, uh, 37 years ago, those, uh, those bows, uh, no longer with us. The longest any of them lived was probably seven years. I had a couple of them that were about nine feet. No surprise. That's seven years. And, um, and, and they just eventually died. Probably, uh, we kind of suspect that the organs can't keep up with the growth rate growth rate that the muscles and bone structure go through when you feed them when you way 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 overfeed them but uh, the greater point is i just wanted to mention how big you can get them and uh, now the uh, the irony is that biggest one at eight months old is uh, about the size that most of my females are when they're five years old now um, so it's quite a, quite a transition I've gone through over the years, uh, raising my females, uh, more and more slowly. It's much better for them longevity wise. Uh, this female, this is her third litter, by the way, third year in a row. And, uh, she is, uh, eight years old. So I started breeding her when she was about five feet and five years old. And... The, the babies from my uh, first litter, the first one that I bred, Big Baby, I bred her when she was two and a half years old. And by then, I had become acquainted with some other herpers out there. I found out about uh, the Northern Ohio Association of Reptile Keepers in, uh, in Ohio. It was a large herp society, and they had a newsletter, which I subscribed to, uh, Dick Bartlett was the primary writer, which he did, uh, wrote for them for many, many decades for free. Um, he is the premier writer of all, all things, uh, reptile, as far as I'm concerned, uh, in the U S you know, for, for nothing. I mean, he did it for free, uh, for many decades. And then eventually when reptiles magazine came around, they, they recruited him to write for them. Uh, you've all seen his photography, uh, which is excellent, and his writings. And uh, back when Noah was around, he wrote for them for free, and there were no pictures. It was just a little kind of a small uh, stapled together paper pamphlet, really. Well, one of the people I'd found in the directory in that uh, Noah was Brian Sharp. And Brian you know, who is a, uh, some kind of federal law enforcement, uh, guy and about 10 years older than me. So he was in his thirties when I'm calling him. So I was calling him, asking him about breeding boas. And we talked a lot about breeding boas. He talked to me. I was nobody. I was nobody from nowhere. You know, some kid up in Minnesota is breeding boas and calling, uh, Brian Sharp, who's got you know, 20 years experience keeping reptiles and he gave me the time of day. So I, I really appreciated that. But, uh, he, he told me that he was basically, he was really impressed that I was breeding boas and that I'd had, uh, you know, a number of litters. And that when I, I told him that this baby from my first litter, I'd bred her at two and a half years old. He said, you've got to do document that that's a big deal. That's uh that's pretty important. Look at that. Look at that little ocean of goo. So eventually I did, we did talk about that. I'm not sure if that was in my reptiles magazine article or not, but I bred that female. I think she had 18, 18 babies and slugs or so. She was about eight feet by the time I bred her when she was, um, two and a half years old. And, uh, those babies were nice. Boy, were they beautiful. And, uh, one of those babies one of those babies in particular was one of the pinkest boas I ever had. Uh, never did breed that one, but I remember it. <laughs> Just pretty amazing. It's the same. It's the exact same bloodline that the uh, the female side of the prodigy boas came from. Incidentally, so the uh, the male that produced my first litter, I bought from. Um, 
some parents whose son was at college and they they kept the uh, the snake in an aquarium because they with a lid on it and they were afraid to get into the cage so the cage was filthy they would drop a rat in every once in a while and pour water in through a screen and there was a dish a plate on the bottom where the water would collect and uh, that's how that snake had to get a drink of water so i bought that snake uh in the chicago area when i was visiting my grandmother one one time when I was visiting her, it was like 1984 or so. And he was probably about eight years old. So he was, he was, I'm sure an import from the mid seventies. And, um, he was about seven feet when I got him. There's, we've seen, or I posted a picture of him numerous times online. And, um, he was, uh, he was a great animal. He was a great animal. And the female I'd picked up from a guy named Greg Kuhar in Clarksburg, West Virginia in about 1984, maybe it was 85. It was a little bit, it was before I got the mail. So it was before uh, 86 when I had the first litter. And uh, she was born in 1976 and he, he bought her at a pet shop in Clarksburg, um, presumably an import. And, uh, and this bloodline is where the female side of the prodigy boas came from, uh, ultimately. So Big Mama and Big Daddy were, I, I don't remember, grandparents or great-grandparents of the original, maybe great-great-grandparents of the original prodigy boas. And the male, uh, which um, Clay English obtained from someone in California that it was for sale on Kingsnake, uh, was he got it because it was just a really, really light washed out, uh, Colombian. And, uh, it, that could have been related. I don't know. I'd wholesaled quite a few snakes out in California before that time to Cal Zoological. Also did a trade with East Bay Vivarium, uh, which is where the East Bay Vivarium Red Group or EB, EBV animals came from. The, the original ones came from animals that he had obtained from me uh, way back in the day. And so that's sort of the long history of where prodigies came from. So ultimately, um, these animals in this video that you're watching are all het prodigy from the prodigy motley male that sired this litter. That female is looking around wondering what's going on. And so these are all het prodigy. Uh, so it comes full circle from my original, original animals, which were from imports from the 70s. And uh, this female is a uh, jungle ghost, and I got her from uh, Ryan Horsch uh, uh, many years ago when she was a baby. So at any rate, that kind of gives you a, a lot of history. A lot of history. This female is looking around. I was a little bit concerned because... She's a very, very, uh, aggressive isn't the right word, but a very, very defensive animal, <laughs> typically. So I was a little bit concerned about her coming too close to the camera. Uh, I didn't want her to bite the camera. I didn't want to hurt herself. I definitely didn't want her to bite me, although I was trying to stay back. My arms were killing me holding this camera up because I just got done working my shoulders in my workout. So at any rate, she had done more work than I had, and uh, this pretty much sums up what's going on in this video with these babies. And um, mom never did kind of scoop those babies and push them around like I was hoping. But uh, I hope you enjoyed seeing the video of these babies being born. I certainly enjoyed babbling on endlessly on about it. And please subscribe. Uh, get your friends to subscribe and uh, hit the notifications button. Thanks for watching. Have a good one.